I would like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Both of these are crucial to our success. And now I will turn things over to my colleague, Shayla Weber, Senior Program Officer with the OCLC Research Library Partnership, who will kick things off for us. Thanks, Mercy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, or good morning from the West Coast. I think it's still morning on the East Coast of the United States, too. Um, so uh, I'm so pleased that, uh, to be here today to be hearing um, from Seth uh, about the, uh, the Emulation as a Service Infrastructure, or EASY, uh, program. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to why we are interested in presenting this this morning, and then I'll turn things over to Seth. Um, if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. Okay. Uh, so um, any of you who've attended our webinars this year have seen this slide before, but um, uh, for those of you that haven't, we uh, the, the Research Library Partnership has a really long um, history of working in archive special and distinctive collections because we know that um, that they're an important site of knowledge production in research libraries and that their um, their unique qualities can make them difficult to sort of scale uh, figure out scaling learning and solutions around them so um, we uh, so we we work in this area um, and have for a long time. And one of the more, one some one of our most recent outputs was this research and learning agenda for archives, special and distinctive collections and research libraries. And it um, I wrote it and really worked with the community to kind of discern what are the um, really kind of key emerge current and emerging issues in in archives and special collections and. Um, and so it is now guiding our work and uh, in this area and and. Many of the webinars that we've been presenting have responded to issues outlined in the agenda. Um, access to collections was one of the kind of key overarching themes of the, the research agenda, um, talking about how kind of our evolving researcher needs, our evolving collections, um, evolving research methodologies really have necessitated um, rethinking the goals and the scope of access and discovery. Um, and uh, you may have seen, we gave an earlier webinar on the collections of data uh, program of work that is really rethinking what it means to access and interact with some of our collections. A week or two ago, we had a great webinar from the Cadre project um, that is thinking about how to give computational access to research data sets. Um, uh, in a sort of a, across a network of libraries. Um, and so the agenda in particular focused on the access needs for born digital collections, born digital archival collections, um, recognizing that uh, a lot of the early work in born digital archives ca uh, focused on capture of files from physical media and the sort of early actions necessary to ensure their authenticity and that, that um, that more work is needed now on all the other parts <laughs> of the of um, the life of the records from kind of ongoing or early work on appraisals all the way through what happens in the reading room. Um, and that many practitioners feel overwhelmed by both the kind of the needs and the possibilities of what an access system for born digital could look like. Um, I think one of the um, biggest challenges is, is something that EASY is tackling, and that's the complex born digital objects with software dependencies um, that you know require some sort of uh, software to um, to run and look at them and uh, as research objects. So um, another reason I I am excited about this program is um, is that it really embodies I think this idea that uh, born digital needs to be a distributed responsibility. You don't just get to hire a digital archivist and call it good. Um, <laughs> that there's a lot of work that needs to be sort of um, spread across not just special collections but the full research library enter enterprise. Um, and and I think 
the EASY model is really interesting. It, it, they're exploring a distributed model across many institutions that help uh, address complex needs, reduce risk, and, and lighten the technical load of in individual institutions. Um, so uh, with that, I will turn things over to Seth Anderson. Seth is a software preservation manager at Yale University Libraries and um, one of uh, the key uh, um, folks working on this project. All right. Thank you, Chayla. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Yes, I am Seth Anderson, Software Preservation Program Manager here at Yale University Library. Uh, and in that role, um, it essentially means that I uh, lead or am responsible for uh, any projects or services that we uh, work on that focus on the use of emulation and preserved software to access uh, collections, materials, uh, and even sort of beyond that, uh, just kind of born digital access via emulation for the university uh, in, a, in a number of different cases. Um, and the largest part of my work since I started uh, in October of 2017, almost two years ago, uh, has been focused on uh, leading the scaling software preservation and emulation infrastructure project, which we uh, decided was much easier to call easy. Um, so emulation as a service infrastructure. Um, and I'm gonna talk today, I'm gonna give a little context of where uh, the project came from, uh, look at our goals and uh, sort of the larger project plan and what we've accomplished to date. Uh, and then I'll give a short demo of kind of the core features of uh, the, the platform that we've developed so far. Uh, and then there will be time for Q&A at the end. Uh, and I'll be joined during the Q&A portion by my boss, uh, Ewan Cocker in the Digital Preservation Program, or Digital Preservation Manager uh, from Yale University Library, who's also the PI on the project. Uh, all right, so to get started, um, just control the slides there, okay. Uh, so as many of you, I would think, are aware, uh, emulation as a strategy or approach for access to digital materials um, has sort of been in discussion and part of uh, the dialogue around foreign digital materials, preservation and access uh, for quite a long time, dating back to the 90s and maybe even earlier. Um, but for much of that time, actually using emulators in a programmatic way, uh, implementing them at scale, uh, was a challenge because there are many different emulators out there. It's a lot of typically open source uh, projects that have varying support for different uh, platforms that we need to emulate. Uh, they're not sort of, in, some, in many cases, not the most user-friendly uh, applications or tools to run. Uh, and so there are a lot of technical barriers uh, to using them programmatically to provide access to digital collections. Uh, and over the years, there have been a number of different uh, initiatives to make that a little easier to provide platforms that allow for uh, more user-friendly or direct use of emulators to access digital collections. Uh, and so emulation as a service is a sort of, is a project that started uh, about 10 years ago uh, at the University of Freiburg uh, and was known previously as I always botch it because there's a German element to this. Uh, the Baden-Württemberg uh, Functional Long-Term Archiving. Uh, and so what uh, BWFLA, or then later on as a more user-friendly title, Emulation as a Service provides, uh, is a web-based interface uh, that simplifies the interaction and use of emulators uh, for 
a sort of non-expert, um, they're non-technical uh, end user. Um, and so what it tries to do is remove those technical barriers and focus the user on the simple questions that they need to solve about their digital collection. So what software do I need to run? What kind of uh, physical computing machine is also required? Um, so you can quickly and easily get something up and running to access your materials without having to tinker too much uh, with software. Um, and so to support that, uh, it provides sort of a management layer um, in front of a larger collection of emulators. So um, it mitigates this need to really decide which emulator platform you're going to use. It uh, allocates all the computing resources and uh, the startup for those uh, so the end user doesn't have to think about how to run the emulator. Um, and it provides uh, a management interface to save uh, describe, interact with, uh, and re-access uh, configured emulation environments. So you don't have to uh, recreate your emulation environment on the fly every time. You can return to it. You can make derivatives from existing uh, computing environments that you've created so you can sort of build on top of your work over time and compile a, a library of sorts of uh, computer environments that you can use to interact with your uh, digital files. Uh, and one of its really like useful and core uh, pieces of functionality uh, is this ability to create derivative environments that uh, use sort of a layer uh, concept um, to save space um, and allow the creation of a large number of emulation environments without um, imposing a large storage requirement. So um, typically what you'll start with uh, is one initial uh, emulated computer environment. So in this diagram, which I apologize is a little um, pixelated, on the left, you have a physical environment, which you recreate as an emulated environment. So you have two primary components here. You have um, the emulated physical components of the computer, which is what the emulator software will provide. Uh, and then you'll have uh, a base disk image file. So that's a full size or whatever you define, the kind of hard drive storage um, for that computing environment. Uh, and so installed on the disk image would be any operating system that you uh, use within that environment uh, and any software you add to it. Um, if you then make an adjustment and save that change to the environment, so you create what we refer to as derivative environments, instead of resaving that entire disk image, the emulation as a service platform only saves the bits that correspond to the changes you've made. So there's kind of a small sliver of information, which could be anywhere from, you know, one to, I don't know, however many megabytes, gigabytes, um, depending on the size of the change, what you've added, um, and what you've done. Um, so then you have, to recreate that derivative environment, you have these two pieces. You have the original base image, and what the system does is it finds that second layer and recombines the two when you want to reaccess that environment. So you can then follow on and have, you know, three, four, five changes, um, and you're not accumulating, you know, terabytes every time. You're accumulating smaller uh, bits uh, over time, and so you save a lot of space. Um, so uh, the team at University of Freiburg, as I mentioned, has been working on this for a number of years. It's done a lot of incredible work. Um, have implemented the system in production at a number of different organizations. Um, but primarily those were project oriented. So um, if there was a problem that uh, the development team at Freiburg identified or one of their partners identified, um, the implementation of emulation as a service would focus on that specific use case. Um, and, you know, what we've been discovering in the community, of course, over the last 
10 plus years is that there are a lot of, there are many use cases that can benefit from emulation. Um, there's a lot of software to be collected um, and uh, few resources for many institutions to acquire all the software they would need to access their digital collections. Um, and despite the uh, improvements and uh, functionality that the Emulation as a Service platform provided, uh, there's still a bit of a technical barrier and some complexity with the system. Uh, so very often, the team at Freiburg is very responsible for the management and administration of the system. Uh, and the front-end UI, um, while useful, uh, you know, required some updates to make it more user-friendly and easier to understand uh, without uh, too much intervention. Um, so at Yale, uh, after when Ewan Cochran Ewan joined uh, the staff, he had been exploring the use of emulation as a service as a means to provide access to our circulating CD-ROM collection. Uh, and that work led to uh, some presentations, which led to some proposals for funding, um, and uh, brought us to EASY, um, which started in uh, officially January of 2018, so we're about a year and a half into the project. Uh, and the goal of EASY is to take the existing emulation as a service platform and implement uh, function, functions in sort of four primary areas that will uh, enable us to scale up the use of EASY for a wider number of use cases uh, and to uh, establish the service as a viable uh, tool for uh, implementing emulation in sort of programmatic fashion uh, at you know, institutions like Yale, but also other um, research support uh, cultural heritage institutions. Uh, so we are focused, um, as I said, in sort of four primary areas. Uh, the first being uh, distributed management, as uh, Chayla mentioned. Uh, so using EASY uh, and this sort of concept of a network of nodes uh, that use the software to better establish community around uh, the use of emulation for uh, collections access and interaction, um, and also cultivating uh, partnerships to inform our development of the software and to guide uh, the future of it as uh, a viable uh, service and um, platform uh, that is sustainable. Uh, and so in that space we've partnered uh, at first with five uh, universities um, uh, on this slide uh, we have Carnegie Mellon University of Virginia University of Notre Dame UC San Diego and Stanford uh, and so this group have been kind of our guinea pigs for the last uh, year uh, I would say uh, and we've been working with them uh, doing a number of uh, sort of capacity building exercises. So looking at the use cases that they might have for using emulation, exploring the requirements of the uh, digital materials in those spaces, um, trying to get some grasp on user expectations and uh, workflows for uh, setting up uh, emulation and providing access to them. Uh, and they now, uh, since uh, March or April, have been acting as sort of our primary test environment uh, testers for um, the initial release of the Easy Network uh, software um, and will continue to be a part of the testing and optimization and bug reporting uh, process for uh, any future releases and the update to the front end, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and just so everyone's aware, uh, we will be potentially, we're trying to figure out our strategy for this. We're looking for another round of nodes to join, so we want to at least get up to 10 by the end of the project. 
Um, so we're going to be sending out some invites to those institutions we know have already expect, expressed interest to us, but we are also, you know, if you feel as if your institution is ready and equipped with um, the time and uh, support resources to be involved in the project and you want to, you know, be an early tester, um, please get in touch and we'd be happy to talk about it. Um, but we're looking to kick off kind of that initial orientation process uh, this fall um, and later this year in November and December. So keep an eye out for any news on that front. Um, kind of one of the the second piece that we're we're really looking at, um, and this is kind of a really big and exciting um, part of the project. I'm realizing I need to speed up already, uh, is this ability in, of sharing software across this distributed infrastructure that we have been talking about. So um, in addition to just being involved in the project, um, being part of the EASY network means that those uh, institutions that are partnered with us and have installed the software uh, on their local infrastructure um, are able to exchange um, software installation materials uh, and configured environments between the nodes. So I'll give an example of this in a bit in the demo, but uh, the idea here being like that I mentioned, uh, a response to what I mentioned earlier uh, in that not every institution, uh, of course, has the resources, the time, the money, the staff to uh, acquire and um, install and, 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 and uh, investigate all of the software that they would need to support their collections. Uh, so uh, we wanted to implement this functionality that allows us to exchange those materials back and forth. So uh, if I need something that Stanford has, I can copy it to my node and run it in an environment, install it, create a derivative from that if I need to. Um, and to get that process started, we've uh, been working with a software collection that we have a copy of here at the university uh, and using student workers have started the process of creating a sort of core library of uh, pre-configured software environments um, to share to the network. So um, we've uh, been working hard over the last six months to really ramp up these efforts and, and try to get, uh, hopefully by the end of the grant project, at least 3,000 environments um, or software applications installed and, and available to the members of the Easy Network uh, by the end of the project. Um, the third area of focus for the project is uh, focused on uh, documentation of the resources that we are collecting and using uh, in EASY. Um, uh, a big challenge of this being, of course, that there have been, there have been in the past attempts to define uh, models uh, for describing computing environments and software, um, but there is no sort of core standard for that. Um, there, so building off of that previous work, um, we take, took a look at what we required uh, in the system and have been building our own model um, for description of software materials, uh, software applications, computing environments. Uh, and it's an interesting challenge uh, because you, you know, we have to weigh different requirements both for, you know, what's, what's useful for discovery. Uh, from an end user's uh, standpoint, what's useful for the system to digest and uh, make use of um, for automation or for recommendations, um, or just simply for running the emulation environments. Uh, and then we, of course, want to make sure we're capturing sort of historical information about the applications that we uh, work with. Uh, so we've been, uh, of course, doing research as well to identify publishers and um, 
release dates and system requirements and all of this. Um, and so it's a big undertaking. So in addition to just doing the configuration work that we've asked the students to do, um, they're also doing a lot of cataloging of software applications. Um, and we've been working with uh, Kath Horton, uh, who's a previously a clear fellow here at Yale University Library and is the leader of the Wikidata for Digital Preservation project to incorporate uh, her work on that project uh, and her expertise in sort of semantic web technologies to uh, both uh, pull from that work, so pull from the Wikidata knowledge base um, and gather information uh, on, you know, the, the software applications that we're working with, um, but also using that as like a core means of compiling developer information, information about different uh, devices and machines that we're working with. Uh, but also we want to be good citizens. Uh, so any information that we generate as part of this work, uh, CAT has been taking and uh, working on how to submit um, that information back into Wikidata so that we expand the uh, amount of open and machine readable documentation that's available uh, on the web. Uh, so Chayla pointed out that we have some examples of the metadata we've been collecting. A quick, this is, this is just like a small piece, um, but for most software applications we are, of course, this is like most of the descriptive information. I wanted to point out specifically here that we are also uh, doing a lot of work to document um, the format support of specific applications. So looking at what um, the uh, application says it can read and write uh, so that we can think through some automation uh, on that front. Um, and Oh, this is where I'm also supposed to talk about the complete overhaul of the front end. So in addition to um, the documentation work, we're also looking to improve the user friendliness of uh, the actual UI. I apologize, this is a bit pixelated. Um, but we're working with a group out of uh, Wisconsin of front end developers of Portal Media to completely rethink how uh, our users interact with the system. Um, and uh, implement sort of improved search and discovery features. Uh, so there will be uh, sort of a more comprehensive ability to do keyword searching, to use facets to narrow search results. Um, there's a lot around this that we're currently working through, which um, I'm excited to share in the coming months as that gets developed and rolled out. Uh, so I'm gonna move very quickly because I still have to get to the demo. And I wanna leave time for Q&A. Um, but uh, the fourth area of focus for the project is on demonstrating the use of emulation for specific access purposes. Uh, so we'll be working over the next year to prototype and uh, demonstrate uh, different tools um, in these four specific areas. So one is um, building off the CD-ROM emulation work that we've been doing here at Yale, um, incorporating uh, emulated CD-ROM environments into the easy network. Uh, so that institutions that already have copies of these materials in their collections can benefit from the work that Yale has done and just copy uh, those emulation environments that we've set up uh, to their nodes. Uh, implementing a virtual reading room service, so this is primarily around sort of access level permissions to provide uh, researcher access to, say, a computing environment with certain restrictions around uh, location, time, uh, user accounts, et cetera. Uh, and a scientific software portal, which uh, the purpose being to focus on uh, the reproducibility of legacy data sets. Uh, so we're working through what that means, what, it, what, what a portal of that sort would look like. It's primarily, I think, going to be uh, kind of a workflow engine uh, that would allow researchers to propose the creation of an environment for their data sets and then to manipulate that so that it reproduces accurately and then use those environments to cite their research or um, create, uh, say, a preservation environment to add to whatever they submit to um, a research data repository. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, we're working now on this uh, API service that will automatically will analyze uh, file formats of submitted digital objects and um, choose the environments in which to run them, and then hopefully, uh, if we can get this to work, automatically render them in the software uh, that's been identified. Um, so uh, there's a blog post on that, which I should have shared the link to. Um, Ewan, if you want, um, feel free to add that in the chat. Um, and we will hopefully have a prototype of that ready to go in September around the time of IPRES. Um, so this is our team. Uh, we've got three uh, staff members here at Yale who are working on the project. Um, Ewan, of course, is the PI, is, spends a portion of his time focused on our work, uh, and then myself and uh, Ethan Gates, uh, both members of the Digital Preservation Services staff here at Yale, are focused primarily on the project. Um, there's the original team out of Freiburg who have sort of spun off a company called OpenSLX to focus on uh, support and maintenance for projects on focused on emulation as a service. Uh, there's Portal Media, who I mentioned as the front end or the UX UI development for us. Jessica Meyerson from Educopia and Spin, who unfortunately could not be here today, um, has been supporting our communications and outreach throughout the project. And then, again, as I mentioned, Kat Thornton um, from the WikiDP project uh, has been helping us in sort of the semantic web area of our work. Um, just a quick note on um, the uh, legal basis for this project. So uh, if you aren't aware or haven't read it yet, um, the ARL Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for Software Preservation focuses on the use uh, or sort of the legal basis for um, preserving software and reusing it in um, the context of fair use. Uh, and included in that report was one criteria that focused specifically on something like emulation as a service. Uh, so if you have questions about whether or not this is legal, um, feel free to check out that report or send your questions to Brandon at UVA, Brandon Butler, uh, who has done a lot of work in this space to uh, help define how we can, we can use software. Um, so I think I'm going to just skip ahead. I just to, uh, got slides on what we've been up to. Primarily, um, we've been developing and testing the things that I'm about to show you. So um, I will just point out as well, though, in the last three months, um, so from April to June, we did release a uh, public sandbox version. Uh, the link for that will be coming up later. Um, so you can actually interact with a version of the Emulation as a Service or Easy Platform that's open on the the web um, that has uh, open source uh, operating systems and applications installed in it. Uh, and then over the next three months, um, we're really diving into our UI development. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're working on that prototype of that um, API service to uh, automate some of the file format uh, analysis and uh, object rendering. Um, so now for a demo, and I'll try and keep this pretty quick. Um, so I'm going to show first uh, just a quick demonstration of how the system works uh, as far as installing software and setting up a new environment. Uh, I remind myself to expand this. Um, let me just make sure that everyone can. I'm going to hope you can all see this. Just chat if you can't. Are we good? It looks good. Okay. Um, so this interface, this is the interface developed by OpenSLX. So it's a uh, simple GUI meant to demonstrate the sort of back end core functionality that they've worked on. So the new interface will kind of completely overhaul this and provide additional features for user friendliness. Um, but conceptually, the system is split up into three specific types of resources. You have the configured computing environments that uh, have been saved and are available to interact with. 
Uh, you have the software installation materials that you can add to a computer environment. Uh, and then you have these content objects, so that would be any like digital files, just images of CD-ROMs, what have you, that you want to add to an environment to interact with. Uh, so I'm going to just demonstrate, see if I get ahead of myself. It's hard to time what you're saying with the video. Uh, so within environments, we have a few different types. You have base environments, which would be your starting point for uh, creating, I see I'm moving too fast now, uh, a derivative uh, derivative environments or adding content to those to create an object environment. Um, so a base environment is at minimum an operating system installed in uh, an emulated envir computing environment or an operating system plus any number of uh, software applications. So you can see some of these here have multiple uh, things installed. Um, within Base environments, we have then this area that refers to uh, items that are uh, well, their place in the network, essentially. So uh, if an environment is private, that means that it is local to that node's infrastructure um, and is not seen by others in the network. Um, if it's public, that means that you've either shared it or copied it from the network. Um, so those are materials that come from other institutions or that you are sharing with other institutions. And then the remote tab is anything that's been shared by other nodes in the network but you haven't copied to your uh, infrastructure. Uh, so if I wanted to install a new application, say it's just part of, let's say I'm a student and I've been told to install this application in, in an operating system, I'll find my sort of starting point, which would be this Windows 95 base environment and then choose the software I want to install. In this case, I'll be installing WordPerfect. And what the system is now doing is it, it's allocating the compute resources for the emulator, booting it up, and retrieving um, the uh, disk images that constitute the hard drive of that computer, and also retrieving the, um, in this case, the CD-ROM images of that WordPerfect software application um, and mounting those in the CD-ROM drive. Uh, and so at this point, it's, I'm essentially just interacting with a computer as if I had the physical computer in front of me, so the desktop is available to me to manipulate as needed. So in this case, I would start up the CD-ROM and install WordPerfect. I'm going to fast forward through all of this because this is just kind of a typical installation process, right? And if that was successful, which it was, then I now have the application available to me to run. Uh, so if I shut down, I then can save the environment. So now I'm creating a derivative environment uh, from that Windows 95 base. And uh, so let's see, let's see demo. Move this quickly. All right. So the environment has saved, and it should be in the private tab because I have not yet shared it to the Easy Network. So there it is. And if I want to share it, I can go to the details page, click publish. It'll warn me. So yes, I do want to share this. Move in quickly. So now when I return to the environments page, if I go to the public tab, it's now shared. So let's assume now that I am another user at another institution, um, and this is a separate node of Easy installed somewhere else, and I have uh, a content from my archive that is a WordPerfect file uh, that I need to access. But unfortunately, I don't have WordPerfect uh, installed or available to me even at my institution. So I need to see if it's available in the network so I can uh, and just ignore that it actually does exist on this node. Um, <laughs> but I want to use that OCLC demo that I created. So um, because I haven't synchronized yet with the network, that environment that I just shared from Prezium UO2, which was this first tab that I was on, 
uh, is not yet available. So um, we use OAIPMH uh, for the synchronization between nodes of the network. So what it is essentially doing is exchanging the metadata about the environments and the software that have been shared. So um, I've already set up the endpoint for synchronization to that, uh, pres that other Yale node that I can work with. And if I click synchronize incremental, that will add any new environments that have been shared uh, since the last time I synchronized uh, to my node. So I can now look at the remote tab and see, all right, is that OCLC demo that I want to use available? And guess what? It is. Uh, and if I want to actually use it at my node, I can then copy all the data of that intro environment to uh, this pres, this, let's say, node 5, which is what I'm using for the demo. Uh, and that does take some time. But if the magic of video editing, uh, I can see now, I think I skipped ahead of myself, right. So um, if I go to the public tab, right, so these are things that I've copied from the network, it's now available for use uh, at my node. So I can now go back to that digital file that I need to access. I can add an environment to its record and say, all right, I want to use that OCLC demo environment to access this WordPerfect file. And if I run it, so now, because that software application is installed, it's pulling the disk image files to uh, recreate that OCLC demo that I, re that I made in the previous node, booting that up, and then retrieving um, that sample file that I want to look at and mounting that as a CD-ROM. And we do that just because it's a little easier for across all of the different emulators uh, to mount a disk image than it is to actually push uh, digital files into um, an environment. So for, it's just a compatibility uh, step that we take. And if I click on that, it will open my WordPerfect file, I have to do some conversion, and ta-da, we've now accessed that file. And if I wanted to continue and re come back to this uh, content, I could then save this environment, uh, and it would be added to that object environment tab in our instance of the software. And with that, kind of reached perfect timing. Um, so the floor is open for Q&A. Just I've listed here as well um, a few of the upcoming, well, some of the things you can do to learn more about the project. Um, so we have two more episodes of this first uh, webinar series that we've been uh, putting on uh, for the last two months um, in September and October. Uh, if you want sort of regular updates, um, I do a bi-monthly, I think it is, entry in the Software Preservation Network's newsletter um, because we are an affiliated project of SPIN, um, and I give an update on what we've been up to. Um, as I mentioned, you can, of course, uh, access a version of EASY uh, on, at the open source software sandbox. Uh, and we will potentially be uh, calling out um, for new node partners uh, this fall. Um, and Ewan just messaged me to make sure. I also mentioned, I forgot to put this into the project team slide. Uh, we're also working with Catherine Skinner at Educopia um, to do some sustainability planning for the service. Um, so we're looking by the end of the grant project to um, have some pathway or a proposed roadmap for achieving a sustainable service model. Um, so we're looking at the cost of implementing a node, what types of models we can have, um, how those services are, yeah, supported uh, both either by contributions of the users or um, further grant funding, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so 
questions? Um, so we had a question earlier from uh, Elvia uh, Arroyo Ramirez at um, UC Irvine, uh, and she asked, what are the minimum requirements needed to be considered as a node institution? Yes. Uh, so we're currently working on revamping those a bit now that we have some more information from working with the first round of nodes. Um, Primarily, uh, we ask for um, one, of course, you have to provide the infrastructure to install and operate the easy software um, so that that can either be on you know, local physical infrastructure, um, whether that's your central IT or library IT, um, but also um, we've had some deployments in the cloud, uh, so that's just the depends on the preferences of your um, IT departments. Uh, but also, we do ask for a certain amount of staff commitment. Um, so we have regular meetings uh, once a month uh, with the nodes. We've been asking them to work through some activities each month. Um, so uh, it's primarily uh, both the technical commitment and then uh, like staff resource commitment. Great, thanks. Um, Dara Baker has asked uh, on the question of private versus public, what does the institution need to know to be able to publish something to be shared? That's a good question. Um, so it's, it's a judgment call from the institutions and um, I would point out first of all that nothing no environment that contains materials or content objects as we would call them so um, uh, that like that that environment that I just created that had that word perfect file if that was something from the collection that was being built for access by students or staff or research at Yale that can't be shared to the network um, the sharing to the pub, like sharing to the network, um, you know, it, it means that everybody in the network can use it. So there's there are arguments under fair use that that is of course allowed. Um, there are restrictions on um, what you can share um, based on other sort of legal frameworks, um, which. Um, I would encourage you to check out the uh, Spins, um user guide for the, oh, I can't remember it off the top of my head. I'll find the link in a sec. Um, but uh, from our end, we primarily share anything um, that we can. Uh, so most of the operating system environments or any of the software, the environments that have collections of software or individual software applications on them, we share. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's like an institutional policy. We provide the ability to do it, but there's no higher level of permissions or restrictions on top of it. Um, hi folks, it's Eagle in here. I just wanted to add something to that. We, I've done a few talks about this as well, and um, a question that sometimes comes up, and I think it's because of the uh, confusion I introduced, unfortunately, is um, around what gets shared. And just to be really clear, the only things you're really able to share at the moment are the software environments, and that's quite deliberate. So if you in, in import some content, like some objects from your um, local repositories, the intent is never to share those within the easy network. It's really only the, the software that's um, generic and that um, might need to be used by lots of other organizations. Um, so your, your, your local restricted content, there's no intent to share that in the easy network. Great. Um, and we have another question from uh, 
Svetlana Malzunsky, I'm sorry if I pronounced, I definitely pronounced your last name wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, can each environment only support the installation of one piece of software, or could you install different software in a single environment to read multiple file formats? Uh, good question. You can install as many applications as you want. So, uh, currently you can only do them one at a time, so that's why most of the environments we have appear to only have one application, um, but we're working on allowing users potentially to sort of compile a number of different applications and then install them into a sort of more robust computing environment. Um, we also made a decision um, just to strategically to uh, install one application at a time as a means of improving uh, well, it's it's intended for this uh, API service, what what we call the Universal Virtual Interactor, um, so that instead of getting environments that have six different applications on it for one file format, um, we can more easily make the match between one application and the file format of the submitted object, and then just return that environment that has a single application installed. So it's just an attempt to kind of simplify uh, the end user's experience in interacting with their objects uh, and not not providing them too many other uh, applications to tinker with. But you can, do, yeah, I mean, you can build, you could build an application with, or an environment with 25, 30, 50, 100 software applications installed. Um, I have a question about uh, sort of workflow and what this this looks like in terms of like getting getting to the point where you can let a user use it. Do you um, uh, do you have to kind of set up an environment per sort of Per, per user or per use knowing like, okay, a user wants to come in and use this collection and I know I have a bunch of Photoshop docs that they are gonna wanna look at it, an old version of Photoshop running OS, whatever. Um, you know, do I have, like, and but then they're also gonna wanna read some WordPerfect docs that are also in the collection. Like, how does that, how yeah, does that work? Yeah, something <laughs> we're currently trying to think through. Um, and the challenge we have right now is that we, you know, the idea is to build access services on top of uh, the sort of core easy platform. So what I've shown and what we're working on doing an overhaul of for the front end is primarily intended for like staff use, right? So it's the people who are actually configuring the environments. Uh, so collection managers, preservation librarians, et cetera. Um, and there is this question, right? Um, so we've been doing some test cases to look at um, how to do it in production. Um, and yeah, it's a challenge because you, we, it's hard to anticipate the end user's like research practice. One, because people haven't used emulators much. Um, and uh, we also don't want to, you know, just give them free reign to mess around with everything that's in the, the environment. So um, we're, I would say we're still working that out. Um, one interesting area of research that's happening right now is with another SPIN project, the Fostering Communities of Practice project, um, for which we are providing um, infrastructure support, so all of the institutions who are part of that cohort and that project have access to a sandbox version of uh, EASY and have been using that to look at different workflows for um, processing digital materials, setting them up for access and providing access to them. Um, and so we're curious to see how they, what they come up with as far as they're going to be documenting their workflows over the next year. Um, but yeah, it is a real challenge because uh, you know we can we can put the software and the content into an environment, 
uh, but then sort of understanding whether or not that's useful at this point. I mean, it's useful up to a point, but how to support, how to better support uh, research use, I would say, is is our next challenge. Great, thank you. Um, okay, it looks like we're almost at the top of the hour. We have one more question. I'll try to get in here. Um, Tara Baker also asks, for metadata you've been capturing and designating, have you used it yet to search for any use of any of the software? Um, I think we're a little early days for that kind of um, information. Uh, yeah, I, I guess. Uh, Use at this point is primarily from our end of running it and installing it. Um, we do hope to, I mean, we have a number of different ideas for using the metadata. Um, primarily associated with sort of automated uh, services. So in addition to just the identification of compatibility between certain formats and software applications. Um, you know, that service will also allow uh, end users just to confirm whether or not we think there is an available environment um, that would be compatible with their materials. Um, we also, I'm hoping we can expand uh, that compatibility functionality to support as well some analysis of the actual software application materials. So looking at system requirements and matching those up to um, emulated physical components in the computer environments to say, okay, I think this machine that we've configured would be compatible with this software application. Um, but we're still pretty far out from that. Great. Well, thank you, Seth. Uh, we are just about at the top of the hour, um, and Seth uh, Ewan, thank you for sharing about this important work. Uh, I think there are lots of um, ideas flowing now, and, and folks who want to share with uh, colleagues to get some conversations going about this. So we'll be looking out for updates uh, about the project. And um, to all of our attendees, thank you for joining us today. We'll post a recording of this webinar, um, and we'll send you an email with the slides and the recording link and these other links shared. Thank you for joining us, and this concludes today's webinar. Bye.